you sound like you feel good this morning by the way you sang. So it does something when you're sitting up here and hearing you sing songs out like that. It's fantastic. So we continue this week in a series that we started last week that uh, is entitled, as you see, Follow Me. And um, ultimately, uh, this, what we're talking about throughout the series is this whole idea of some critical pieces to being a follower of Jesus. What does it look like? Some waypoints along the, along the way. Um, for many of you, this will be not new news. But for some of you, um, uh, perhaps we'll fill in some gaps along the way. And it'll create some good questions for you and the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with. And if there's ever a point in time where um, throughout the series or any time that uh, you feel like you want to talk, or you need some resolution to something, or somebody who can just go, I don't know either. I'm more than glad to help you. Because uh, <laughs> most of the time I don't know the answer either. Uh, but what I do know is that I'll be happy to come alongside of you and see what God's doing with you and then just be a good dialogue partner. And so I'm more than happy to do that if the occasion arises. So... Last week we talked around this idea. We began in the Gospel of Matthew, written by the same guy that we looked at last week, and just talked around the idea of the, that Jesus invites people who are nothing like him to be a part of the kingdom of God. And that in, apparently, from what we saw last week, is that Jesus says that you can belong to the family of God before you necessarily behave and believe like everybody else thinks that you have to behave and believe which was good news for somebody like me. Maybe not you, but uh, because most of the time I don't have it all together either. And so today, we're going to look at this idea of next steps. So in the Gospels, people like me throughout, the, um, throughout all preaching time, and if you've been around the church for a while, you probably know this is true, that, that in the church, uh, people that stand in a place like this have oftentimes painted this picture of the disciples as if they are like Jesus' superheroes. And that's my word. It's not, the, it's not the Greek word or anything like that. But it's, it's like when you read the Gospel of Matthew in particular, Matthew chapter 4, look at how Matthew talks about his own, own thing in verse 18. We're not going to be there, but I'm going to read it to you today. It says this. It says, As he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, because that's the favorite brother. Um, it, yeah, I thought you'd catch up with that. Yeah. And... and and his brother Andrew, casting a net by the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And verse 20, he says, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. What? Like, isn't it, like everybody your whole life, if you've been connected to the church, when they invite you to follow Jesus, that's kind of the gold standard right there. Is that Jesus, when you have an encounter with him and you hear that you're supposed to follow him, you're just supposed to abandon everything and take up after Jesus. Really? Are those guys crazy? I mean, did they not have bills? Did, did they not have, I mean, did they not like to eat? Now, there's some legitimate things you have to deal with it, when you paint the picture that when Jesus says extends you and I an invitation to follow him, there's some legitimate things you have to deal with in this idea of, well, does that mean we just immediately left everything and followed him? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most of the time, most of the time in all of our lives, it's been presented to us in, in, a, in an implicit way. And it's not been said, but it's been implied that there's something maybe not right with our faith because we don't just jump on the Jesus bandwagon like the disciples in the Scripture did. And today I want to argue with you a place that I've never seen another scholar argue, so that means that it's probably wrong. But what it also means, though, is that I really think this is the case. The Gospels aren't meant to, they don't always tell the exact same story. They tell elements of a similar story throughout. And so when we read in Matthew that they left all their stuff and immediately followed Jesus, I think in Luke, he takes a different track. And I think that you've got to be able to put the ends together here. And we're going to be, it'll be on the screen. If you've got your Bible with you, we'll be in Luke chapter 5. It'll be a great place to do. If your Bible happens to ring, um, that's cool. Turn the ringer off and get to, to Luke chapter 5, and we'll look at that together. It begins here. It says, Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and a crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats that were there at the shore of the lake, and fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. 
So Luke always paints this picture that, that in, throughout his gospel, it's always this business of the crowds pushing in on Jesus to find out what God has to say. And so today we come up on an episode that's not new, that all these people have pressed in on Jesus, and they've pressed in on him to the point that we're going to see in a minute. Jesus has got to do something different. Well, the disciples, I think, are just doing what the disciples normally do. Let's carry on with verse 3. He says, And Jesus got into the boat, the one that was belonging to Simon. And so here's my question. If Simon's got a boat, but... In the other gospel, he just left everything and immediately followed Jesus. How can that be? I mean, what's he doing still fishing if he's following Jesus? And so here's why I think you can get into the story, I can get into the story, we can get into the story, is that the disciples, it appears, on the one hand, had some inner encounter with Jesus. And they understood him as a rabbi and understood him as God's man. And then all of a sudden, they said, yeah, we'll follow that Jesus guy. But immediately... Eh. immediately they didn't leave everything. It seems to give the impression that they were still fishing. They were like me and you. They had to go back to their 9 to 5 tomorrow. I said yes to Jesus on a Sunday, but I still got to go work. My house payment still comes. My car payment still comes. I like heat. When you live in a day like we did yesterday where it was 81 degrees outside and 82% humidity, I like air conditioning, and the utility man ain't that friendly. He wants his money too. You know, like, what do you, what do you mean I'm supposed to just leave everything and go follow Jesus? So I even think in the Gospels that the disciples early on in the process were just people like me and you. They were bivocational people. They lived in the kingdom of God trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. But they also lived in the real world where they had to go, how do I make all these things work? And so I guess uh, the whole point I'm telling you that is to give you a picture that they're not faith superheroes at this point. You're not any different than them, and they're not any different than you. We're all on equal playing field here. And that was okay with Jesus. And so here's what I think happens here. And again, you need to remember that this is my opinion, and you can completely discount it. It's okay. But then Jesus, it says in verse 3, gets into the boat that belongs to Simon and asks him to put out a little way onto the shore. So if Jesus didn't have any encounter with these guys before, how did he know to ask the right guy, the owner of this boat, to come over and push him out into the water? So here's how I think it goes down. I think he looks over and they see Jesus coming. And like the cloud that follows pig pen on peanuts... That's how the crowd's following Jesus, right? Jesus is walking. There's this whole crowd of people. Dust is everywhere. They've pressed him into the side. And Jesus is not panicked, but he decides, you know what? Um, either I'm going to have to do this walking on water thing sooner than I had anticipated, or, or I got to do something else. And so he looks over, and he sees his friends, the fishermen, the disciples, the people who have already said yes to him, but they happen to be over there washing their nets, minding their business. And he, I think he looks over, and he says, Hey, Pete! Come here. I mean, when you're in a bind, who else do you call but your friends? And so he reaches, oh, he reaches out to one of his friends and says, Hey, man, um, you know, again, my paraphrase, my translation, but can we go out a little bit in the boat here? I, got, I, got, I need to be able to, to talk with this group of people. And so Peter, it says, fine, okay. So he sat down. Peter and he went out in the boat, and he sat down. And taught the crowds from the boat. And here's the first point I want to make with you, other than some of that color commentary, is that faith, friends, faith always comes through hearing the Word of God. Remember that the people who are around came to hear the Word of God from Jesus. And Jesus now has sat down to teach them God's Word. You say, well, what does this whole church thing matter in 21st century world? Well, at least our format still has somebody like me, whether I do it poorly or whether I do it well on any given week, you still have a space where we talk about and teach from the Word of God. Because why? The faith that we inherit, the faith that we're called to, the thing that Jesus invites us to when he says, follow me, comes from hearing the Word of God. And that's why we adhere to what the Scripture says. There's plenty of things in the world that need addressing, and there's plenty of pet projects that anybody can like. But faith comes from hearing the Word of God. That's why we teach out of Scripture and not anybody's opinion or what we wished it said or anything else. 
We stick with what it says and we teach that, not because we're hardline or we don't want anybody to feel welcome. We teach it because the faith that we see from Jesus comes from teaching the Word of God. It comes from hearing. And so that's, Jesus sits down and he, he reaches out to this group of people that he loves and he starts teaching them whatever he taught them. Now, I don't know what he taught. And I, I've argued with Luke every time I deal with this text. I was like, why didn't you tell us what Jesus said? Okay, How, did he tell a parable? You know, one time there was this guy riding a donkey. Uh, that's, that's a bad joke I heard. Never, but you know what I'm talking about. I mean, what, why didn't he did, he, did he start preaching from the Beatitudes? I mean, did he, what, what did he do? And moreover, what did the people expect to hear Jesus say? They pressed in on him. They pressed in on him to the point that he had to draw away from them a little bit and teach. I mean, maybe, maybe this is where you get back into the story. I mean, if Jesus rolled up in here, I got to think this morning that it's not y'all sitting out there. I think if Jesus rolls up, you're, he, you're right here. I'm pressing in. I want to talk to him. I want to know what, like, Jesus, these things are on my mind. Like, how am I supposed to make the ends meet, Lord, when, when the world has gone nuts? It requires all my fixed income to pay for my insurance, and I can't always figure out how I'm going to be able to pay the rent. What am I supposed to do, Lord? How am I supposed to follow you when I don't have enough resources to even follow myself? You know, when, I don't know what they ask, but what I bet the case was, and I hope this is the case anyway, is that when they came, when Jesus came close, he, just like you, began to address some deep things in their life. God, am I doing this right? Are we really, like, can you really help? Are you really trustworthy? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Now, I don't know if that's what you would ask him, and I don't know if that's what they ask him, but whatever's going on as Jesus is teaching from the boat, I got to think it's some pretty good stuff because... I don't know any time Jesus taught something that wasn't good or was bad. But whatever it is, it says, we go on and look at it. It says he finished his teaching, right? And when he had finished speaking, by the way, Peter's still there hearing whatever Jesus is teaching too, right? And he, somebody who's already said yes to Jesus. And then Jesus turns and, and does what only Jesus can do in verse 4. He says, looks at Peter and says, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Next slide there. And Simon says, Master, we have worked all night and haven't caught anything. I want to stop right there for a second. Because now all of a sudden, Jesus isn't teaching the crowd. He's teaching one of his own. This is like intimate time. This is the you and Jesus time. The place that you all secretly want, just like I want. But... I don't know if I want it because I'm scared of what he'll ask me. <laughs> and I think that's where Peter gets to. Master, we worked all night. And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll think that Peter's just, um, it, this is a, it is a, a bit of a trust thing. If you're not careful, you'll miss the significance of what's going on here. Master, we worked all night. And we ain't caught anything. But now it's daytime. And Jesus sitting in the boat with Simon has said to him, let's go fishing. And a seasoned fisherman, what? You're a preacher. What do you know about fishing? Like this, this happens to me with a good friend of mine. He runs an organization, a multi-million dollar organization, and we try to talk about things, and he always thinks that because I work in the context of the church, I have no clue about how the real world, real world works. I said, well, you know, um, I'm part of an organization too, um, and because I don't run business anymore, that doesn't mean I don't know how it works, right? And so they have this, Peter and Jesus have this, this dialogue together. It's like, you don't understand fishing, sir, and Jesus doesn't ask Simon to do anything any different except for one little thing. And all he really does is ask Peter, will you take me fishing? Now, how about you? What if, what if in this next faith step, this next thing like, Jesus, what would you have me do next? How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to follow you? What if your next step is really just that? What if it's Jesus asking you, to do something you're already doing with him. But doing it 
in a little bit different way than you're doing it right now. What if? What if this whole time you've been out looking around to figure out a better mousetrap to this whole following Jesus thing and, and it, right before your face, you've been doing it all along. But Jesus comes along and just says, hey, you should take what you're already doing, but let's change it just a little bit. Let's go on fishing at night. Let's start fishing in the daytime. Could it really be that simple? I mean, could it really be that your step, my step, our next step is right before our very eyes? Could it be something that you're already good at? It can't be that simple, can it? And I think this is what's on Peter's mind because look at what he says. We ain't caught anything all night yet because you say so. I'll let down the nets. And maybe the simplicity of the next step for Peter is the same simplicity of the next step for you and I. Maybe, maybe it's not so much about what to do, but maybe it's trusting whether or not, deciding whether or not you actually can trust Jesus to know what he's talking about. I mean, it sounds good in here. Oh, we, yeah, we trust Jesus. He knows it all. But I have found in my own life that saying that, like I have great big faith right here, but when I go out on Monday morning, my faith gets pretty small sometimes. And sometimes I have to come, come down to this very same decision point, is do I really trust Jesus knows what he's talking about? I mean, really? Could it be that simple? And can I trust him? Yet, not because... Not because of what I worry about, Lord, but because you say so. And so maybe your next step individually, maybe for you, is just to do that whole, I don't know. What if he would have stepped off the end of the stage? Isn't that kind of where you are too? What if there was nothing there to catch me when I make the next step? you got to decide whether or not you can take Jesus at his word. And maybe for you, that's the next thing. And so they go out and do this very thing that Peter's so used to doing, but do it in a little bit different way, and look what happens, verse 7. And they signaled their partners. So when he had done this, verse 6, excuse me, they went out and they caught so many fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come over and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Now, I wonder if just like the disciples, if it really is something we're already doing and it could be that our next step is just that simple, let me broaden this out for us as a church. Could it really be that we're already doing some of the things that God would have us to do next? but he's just asking us to do it in a little bit different way than we're doing it right now. And could it be that if we did what we were already doing in just a little bit different way and trusted Jesus, that the harvest would be so much that we couldn't make the haul on our own? Could that be? And could it be that our next step would be that very thing? Could that be the results of us as a church family taking our next step as well? I don't know. Remember, this is all my opinion, right? So it's worthless. But when Simon saw it, isn't that, isn't that how it happens? When you see Jesus do only the, that Jesus thing he does, <laughs> whatever it looks like, when you see him come in, like he's like, he, Jesus pioneered just-in-time inventory before anybody else on the earth thought it. He manages to intercept and show up just in the nick of time. And so I imagine that, that, that Peter's sitting right here, and isn't it true that when he saw it, he had to grapple with this very reality, right? Is, is maybe my next step, maybe, like maybe I can trust him. And maybe all of a sudden I think in his mind it, clicked like that and he started going I wonder what the next step's going to be when he saw it 
when he saw that he could trust Jesus. It was miraculous. But look at what happens because Peter changes the game on us. And it goes from doing something that we already know how to do in our normal working world. Peter changes the game on us and he says this. He says, when he saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees at his feet and saying, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. We're just going fishing. But isn't it true when you see Jesus do those Jesus things that only Jesus can do? Isn't it true that it almost always, since strike almost, it always resonates with a place deep in your soul and in your spirit that you know that this is only Jesus at work? Isn't it true that that happens to you? It's true it happens to me. I hope it's true for you. And all of a sudden, Peter has to grapple with the reality that all of you and I have to grapple with too. Is that... You don't want me. You don't know what kind of scoundrel I am. You don't know the thing. You don't... This is me dreaming for Peter again. You don't know the jokes I told while we were fishing last night, not catching a fish. You don't know how hard it is to wash these nets out day in and day out. Remember, Mr. Rabbi, preacher guy who don't know nothing about the fishing world. You don't know how that works. Go away from me because you don't, you're not like me. Isn't that, the, isn't, that really how it, isn't that really how it works? It's like when Jesus issues the invitation, and we talked about it again last week some, and it just comes and ties together. Is that most of us think, hmm, he'd let me follow, but he really don't want me on his team. If he knew about me the things I knew about me, But don't miss this. Jesus isn't fooled by the kind of people that he's called to redeem. Nothing you've ever done occurred to Jesus. <laughs> There's never been a time he, you did something and he went, you know what? That just never occurred to me that you would do that. He knows. It's, all, it's okay. It, it, there's never a time. Jesus is completely comfortable with knowing who you are and who it is that he's sent to redeem and who it is he's inviting to be on his team. And look at what he does. This is more important than anything. Jesus knew that, and rather than go away from Peter, he got in the boat with him. What about you? What's that say to you? Is it, it, could it be that rather than raise your objections and about your next step, and, oh, uh, I can't, I'm not there yet. Oh, I'm not spiritual enough. Oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. Could it be that Jesus crawled right into the boat with you instead of go away from you because of your shortcomings? Jesus just said, and? Let's go. I mean, is it really that simple? Are you kidding me? But he said this was all his opinion anyway, so we don't have to listen to that. But really, look at what he does, though. Go away from me, for I'm a sinful man. But that admission, more than Peter knows, is the admission of the prime candidate to accept the invitation to follow Jesus. In fact, that's really the only prerequisite to accepting the invitation to following Jesus. If you don't have any sin... That probably ain't much Jesus can do for you. So don't let that be a, a thing that keeps you from taking the next step. For he, in verse 9, for he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish they had taken. Of course they were. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Again, you remember I told you, I think the disciples are bivocational. And what they said in Matthew about they left everything immediately and followed Jesus, I don't think that's actually what's happening here. Because if so, why are James and John and Simon and all of them, why are they still fishing? So I think this is, there's, a, there's a, an episode here that sounds similar on its face, but that we're really talking about here. Because even the people who decided they said yes to Jesus... They had to be convinced to take their next steps too. And now when they had seen the miraculous, one of those Jesus things that only Jesus can do, 
they have come to a decision point right here in verse 9. Because I think they had a fisherman huddle when they got back ashore. They got everybody together and went, what are we going to do now? Anybody else got any objections you care to raise? I mean, we've been fishing our whole life, and we never even heard of anything like this. And all of a sudden, he, may, he tells us to row out there and in the broad daylight, and we make that kind of catch? What are we going to do now? And see, those guys had been on the shore listening to all that was going on out there. You remember? Because faith always comes from hearing. They had heard all this conversation before. And now all of them had to decide, what's our next step? Well, I don't know if they're faith superheroes or not, but then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. I think that gives you an insight into the conversation those men were having that Jesus overheard. From now on, you will catch people. I had a decision point like this personally. I was doing quite fine, minding my own business, running my own business, doing my own thing. Content to say, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. He's cool. I'm on his team. But I never really had to have one of those decision points like this. Until one day, and most of it was because Jansen came to be. But until one day, I, I, the Lord, in a confluence of factors, just like this, sort of began to speak to me and tell me a little bit about the next step. Went out, leadership inside the context of the local church. And I looked at him just like these fishermen did and said, you must be on drugs. You can't mean me. And if I have to be, and I don't have to be, I'm being honest with you because I want to be, because I want to love you and I want you to love me. If I have to be honest, the, part of the whole hang-up for a guy like me was this particular thing that he invites me to, like he invites you to. Don't be afraid. From now on, I will make you catch people. Now, you laugh when I tell Walmart jokes. But, like, Jesus... You can't invite somebody like me who has a hard time seeing the world the same way other people see it. It gets difficult to love people that clearly are on a different universe than you are. Isn't that the case for you? Maybe you're good at loving people who are really different than you are. I'm not. Because we live in, we live in the United States where as long as your thing don't interact with my thing and we have a mixed up thing, everybody can do whatever they want to thing, that's fine with me. And somehow we've convinced ourselves that that's loving, rather than looking in on each other and going, hmm, not so much, let's talk about that. And so God, you're going to invite me, me talking with the Lord, you're going to invite me to something like this? <laughs> You clearly don't understand the caliber of person you're dealing with. And for me, if I'm honest with you, and again, I'm honest with you because I want to love you and I want you to love me and not because I owe you anything or because you owe me anything. If I'm honest with you, that's the hardest thing about my next step in following Jesus was this whole thing about catching people because you catch, some of that stuff gets on you when you catch them. And they're hard to deal with. And then I remember... I'm one of them It's hard to deal with, too. And so I told you that, give you that picture into my own life, is, is to say sometime your own next step. Sometimes you, like, you got a good, good advocate in your corner. I understand what it's like. If, if you don't understand, like, that people are kind of, it's difficult and off-putting and it's hard to figure out how to follow Jesus and engage with other people because they're hard to engage with and anything else. I get it. But that doesn't refuse the fact that that's our next step. And that it's incumbent upon us together to learn together, to learn to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ for the sake of others so that we might catch more people.
in Jesus' paradigm. And look at this. And when they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. Now, after all that, doesn't that seem a little more legit? Doesn't it seem like after you have some confirming experience with Jesus that it's a whole lot easier to sell out for Jesus in that way? And the reality is, is when you have one of these Jesus-type experiences, like the disciples did here, the reality is you would have left everything too. You would have took your smartphone and called home and said, well, I'm following Jesus. I have decided no turning back, no turning back, as the song goes. And somebody might have hung up on you. They're not faith superheroes, friends. They had confirmation of one thing. They had confirmation that Jesus was somebody they could trust. And that Jesus wasn't asking them to forget everything they knew in their life before they became committed Jesus followers. That they were just being asked to do one thing that they were already doing. And do it in just a little bit different way. So that they could make a catch in the kingdom of God. Could it be that simple for you? Could it be this whole time? The next step has been something you're already doing. Could it be that your next step is, rather than look around to the outside, maybe your next step is to be a little bit more intentional as a husband or a little bit more intentional as a wife about loving the person you committed to a long time ago more intimately and more deeply, just like Jesus is committed to loving you more deeply and more intimately. He said yes to you a long time ago. Maybe it's um, not necessarily worrying about abandoning everything and being called to, to the pulpit type ministry like somebody like me, but maybe it's the realization that Jesus has called you to the ministry right where you already are. And maybe he's not asking you to abandon everything. He's just asking you to start fishing. Just, just start doing something a little bit different. Maybe it's just to say, hey, you know, I would love for us just to have lunch together and just to get to hear a little bit more about your story. Or maybe it's one of those people that you hate dealing with in your circle of influence. And you're convinced that there's no way you could ever connect with them because you had just assumed. I mean, you've studied on ways to kill them. Let's just be honest. And there's really no, you know, there's no I don't know how I can be able, I, there's nothing I can do with that. Maybe it's incumbent upon you and your next step in catching people and learning to love other people is to see who in your circle of influence can connect with that person. And you orchestrating a meeting so that somebody else might can love them, even if you can't. And nobody ever has to know that you're loving them that way. Friends, everybody in this room has got a next step. And when you say yes to Jesus, sometimes that next step is crystal clear. And sometimes it's as difficult to figure out as difficult can be. And today, from our particular passage, all I hope to do is to suggest to you that maybe your next step is right before your very eyes. And maybe it's something you're already doing. And maybe it's something that by trusting Jesus, if you do it just a little bit differently, the game would completely change. Could it be that simple? I know how you can find out. The altar is always a great place to deal with Jesus when he's inviting you to take a next step and you're not real sure there's going to be ground to catch your feet if you take it or you're not even real sure what it is. The altar is a great place 
to meet the God. Meet God who's inviting you to do these things. In fact, the altar, it's a touchstone for God. And for some of you saying, yeah, but that's old-fashioned. I can't get up. People are worried and do all this stuff. Yeah, you can pray fine in your seat. But maybe your next step is to demonstrate to other people that you're taking a next step. And take that next step out of your seat. And come to meet the God who's called you and redeemed you and shaping you and molding you and changing your habits and attitudes. Maybe that's your next step. What I do know is this, is that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and the spirit that continues to shape and mold each of us is doing business with you this morning. It ain't going to stop. You might get by this time. He'll be back. And he's going to be back to remind you that it's probably something you're already doing. But I'm just inviting you to do it a little bit different way this time. Can you feel and do as you feel led this morning by the Spirit as we sing? If you would like for me to pray with you, just look over at me. I'll be here. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you don't want me to leave you alone, that's fine too. But whatever it is, I encourage you, this is a safe space. Let God do the thing he's asking you to do this morning as we sing.